I was going to get into the asking of the questions unless you guys would like to say something um, beforehand. I think I think whatever I would say would be the same thing I'm going to say after you ask the question. So for me, okay, <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. For me, it's, it's always the question is always like, why did you do this? And so you know, it's mm -hmm. going to be. Yes, sir. The screens are starting to gear up, so it's probably time to quiet down. Okay. Uh, the streams are starting to begin. Um, they usually are about two minutes before we start the actual seven o'clock period on um, wfsu.org slash live and on Facebook. So uh, Paul suggests we all kind of keep the conversation to a minimum, if any. Or keep it clean. Or keep it clean. <laughs> 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 the are starting it. So we're on our web page and now Brandy is going to be starting Facebook and YouTube momentarily. So okay. it's time to okay. be ready. Okay. Thank you. One more minute. <laughs> I'm actually going to shut my door real quick. I'm going to go ahead and hide myself because I'm just behind the scenes. I'm not going away. I'm just hiding myself. I know you all will have a great conversation. I look forward to it. And thank you all for doing this. It's just great to have you all part of this. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should be fun. Kim, you're still muted. I'm going to start it now. Okay, thank you. We can see you can we're our participants are joining us. You can see the lower below as they join us. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. <sighs> 63, it's a steady, steady increase. It's very exciting. Yeah, wow. Oh, we've already, looks like we've already got a question possibly. <laughs> Kim, can I say something to all of them or is yes, that? Yes, you can okay. go ahead. We are up to 114, 15, 16. They're, they're still logging on. Okay. You can well, I just want to give everybody a heads up. Uh, welcome to the Invisible History Discussion and Screening. We'll be getting started in just a minute, but we're allowing a little extra time for people to arrive. Um, and we will be getting started shortly. Oh. And yeah, Suzanne, you'll want to remind people they can put their questions in the Q&A. Will do. A lot of people. Kim, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. What do you think? I think so. We're at 126. Okay. Um, a few more will probably trickle in, but I think it's worth just going ahead. Okay. All right. Okay. 
<clears throat> Welcome to our online discussion featuring clips from the new documentary, Invisible History, Middle Florida's Hidden Roots, a film by Valerie Schoon, which will premiere on WFSU Public Media Thursday, May 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern. My name is Suzanne Smith, executive producer for television at WFSU and host of the program Local Roots. Tonight, we'll be talking about and expanding on several of the topics raised in the documentary, which sheds light on the history of plantations and the enslaved in North Florida. We have a wonderful panel joining us to talk about these issues. First is the director of Invisible History, Valerie Schoon. She is also a faculty member at the FSU College of Motion Picture Arts. We're also joined by several historians, some of whom are featured in the film and in the clips we will see tonight. Larry, Dr. Larry Rivers, Distinguished Professor of History in, at Florida A&M University. Dr. Pa Patrick Mason, Professor of Economics and Director of the African American Studies Program at FSU. And Dr. Faith Davis Ruffins, Curator of African American History and Culture, Division of Home and Community Life, in the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Thank you for joining us today. Now, all of our panelists are <laughs> all of our panelists are quite distinguished distinguished in their fields. We invite you to visit our WFSU website to learn more about them, and you can find the link in our chat, um, and uh, we'll be posting that right there, so you should be able to see it shortly. Tonight's discussion is not only live on Zoom, but also on Facebook and WFSU.org/live. We'll be monitoring the chat function of Zoom as well as the Q&A, so please put your questions in there, as well as Facebook for the questions for tonight's audience. So uh, go ahead and put your, put your questions there, please, as they come up. Now, I'd like to start tonight with a short clip from the documentary, which uh, not only sets up the film, uh, but, but, the, but the, sets up the film, but the discussion that we'll be holding tonight. So hold on one second while we get that going. Florida was a very dynamic and diverse place. It was not this Disney World, Donald Duck society where everything was rosy. Florida had a history similar to Alabama and Georgia. You had 45% of enslaved people in Florida. And that 45% produced 90% of all the cotton in Florida by 1860. Cotton, which made Florida the most money, would not have been the product of choice had it not been for the labor of enslaved persons. They were indispensable to increasing Florida's economy. And Florida's economy would not have grown so quickly had it not been for enslaved persons. How else are great capitals to be employed in agriculture in a new country without slaves? And that was the first uh, one of the first sections from the uh, from the documentary. Um, Valerie, my first question for you, that's probably the shortest clip we'll be seeing tonight, uh, but it really does set up uh, many things that people don't necessarily realize about Florida. So Valerie, my first question to you is how did you decide you wanted to focus on this topic for your film? All right, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, well, it turned out that I, I've lived in Tallahassee since 2003 and in 2018, um, we moved close to this enslaved graveyard in um, a neighborhood in Tallahassee in Benton Hills. And my family and I walked a few blocks over to visit the graveyard. And of course I was moved by it. And I decided we should research it. We, you know, I figured we were living on a plantation, we should know the history. But in researching it, I started to realize that it was a much, um, uh, that as, that that Tallahassee, this general region, was a sort of cotton belt. And I didn't, I wasn't aware of how broad the history was in terms of enslavement. And I wanted to make this documentary because I thought it would be 
uh, contributing to the conversation about the history of this place um, and this area, which I've come to love, Tallahassee, but I also wanted to truly understand it. Um, and I figured I would invite um, some people to work on this project with me um, to sort of uh, shed light on this history and to sort of move forward to not only look at slavery here and plantations, but to move forward and sort of see what some of those legacies might have been or might be today from, from that time period. So the social, political, economics. And so I um, partnered with Teresa Mossenberg, who's um, a journalist at WFSU, and of course reached out to some of these wonderful panelists that we have here, as well as others in the community. And I had a tremendous amount of support. This really could not have happened if, the, if I didn't have so much community buy-in. Sorry about my dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If anybody's at home playing bingo, the the first uh, dogs of the Zoom watch has, has been heard. So click, <laughs> check that off your list. Um, the uh, you know Valerie, there was so much history to cover in this time period. How did you um, how did you decide what to leave, take put in and leave out? Um, that is always a challenge for filmmakers, um, whether you're doing a book adaptation or doing or working on um, something historical. And I, you can never tell the complete story, really. Um, and so you can just sort of focus on a section. So I think because our first goal was to sort of tell the story of these 9,000 enslaved people who lived and died here, as well as just a general history of slavery, um, that took up a, a sizable chunk. Um, and then we wanted to not leave it there, though, because we don't feel that slavery is um, something that is has no relevance to today. So then we thought we would bring it forward, um, but in a sort of overview manner um, to sort of understand those um, legacies. But of course, Florida's history is um, extends, you know, before this time period, but this is a time period that we decided to uh, focus on. Um, to our historians that are joining us, um, what do you find to be the areas that people don't, topics of our local history that people just don't know enough about or know anything about. Dr. Rivers, uh, let's start with you. Glad, right. Uh, there are several uh, topics. Uh, uh, when I teach my classes, I asked uh, in my um, Florida history class to uh, for students to tell me something that they know about the development of Florida. They do not know about the Spanish period. Um, they, they simply think that uh, Florida started around 1819, 1821, but they don't know anything prior to that. Uh, they don't know the diversity uh, of Florida in terms of East and West Florida having a strong Spanish tradition uh, and Middle Florida, the area from the Apalachicola to the Swanee Rivers that they designated that area as Middle Florida, five basic counties. Uh, that those counties were designated as uh, cotton producing counties, where in East and West Florida, you had a whole different kind of uh, economy. You had uh, uh, mariners, you had shipbuilding. But when they look at Florida, they often simply talk about Florida as a place to come and relax, to enjoy, to go to Disney World, just to have a good time. And they, they have seen over years, uh, Dr. Mason, they've seen over years these commercials inviting folk mm. to come as though Florida had no history. But Florida certainly uh, has a history. And there's there are a couple other things I would like to say about that, but I'm certainly going to um, uh, give uh, Dr. Mason opportunity to also talk about this. Yeah, I would say it's the, the migration into the state is definitely something that I think most people don't really uh, pay attention to, especially the African-American migration into the state. I mean, there, there were African-Americans in the state before it becomes a part of the United States. So so my, my right. earliest ancestor probably arrived in Florida sometime between 1763 and 1783. Um, and another ancestor arrived shortly after Florida became a part of the U.S. I mean, born here in, in 1832. And so people, and, and in fact, the earliest ancestor was Antonio Proctor, who actually came from the Caribbean. Another ancestor came from Virginia, which is very typical. 
after slavery and people coming from North Carolina. Before the American period, there are black forts in the state. It's a complex relationship between the black population, the Spanish population, mm -hmm. the Native American population that was here. And surprisingly, you know, most of that is not covered in school. I didn't learn any of that in school, right? Uh, it, it, at any level of my education, it's sort of stuff that I learned on my own after, after you know, finishing school, really. And then um, Florida at one point, uh, pointed out earlier, nearly half the population of this state when, when we get to the, the end of the period of enslavement in 1865, almost half the population of the state were African-Americans. And I don't think people yes. knew that this was such a heavily African-American state. Mm -hmm. And then later on, very so people were, you know, Florida is, is the migrations are, are different in Florida. Everywhere else, people migrated north. When Florida people migrated south, right? And they started a little bit earlier than some other places. So, yeah, there's a lot about the history of this state that's just fascinating. It's really not often taught in schools. Dr. Ruffins, um, the, the, you've got the, the broader picture from being at the Smithsonian for, for this, this time period and how Florida is perceived in that. What do you also feel that people are overlooking in the, in the history of Florida's relationship with the other states or during this time period and on these invisible history moments? Well, I certainly um, uh, concur with what Dr. Mason and Dr. Rivers have said and, and emphasize, for example, that there are three Seminole Wars to take place in Florida. Right. And the Seminole mm -hmm. uh, people who are to some degree made up of uh, escaped uh, enslaved people and also other native uh, peoples who have come together to form what was what was essentially uh, a, a new kind of a formation together that became the Seminole people. There are three Seminole wars that the Seminoles win the first two. They managed to push back um, uh, the American uh, forces, but uh, they are eventually overwhelmed by the numbers. And in the third Seminole war, uh, there are people who leave Florida and go as far as Mexico and other places uh, in order to remain free. The other, so I would say this complex uh, Spanish history is is a, a virtually uh, is very important for understanding the relationship of Florida not only to the rest of the United States but to the Caribbean, because Florida uh, the is part, especially in the colonial and early national periods, is really part of a larger cultural framework that includes uh, much of the Caribbean and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. The other thing that I would say is, is more about 20th century history, which is that many people don't realize that, um, you know, Florida and some of the other places we think of today, uh, such as uh, South Carolina and Georgia, Sea Islands and places like this, really did not become tourist destinations until the 1950s and later. And part of that has to do with air conditioning. As you all know, it's very hot in Florida in the summer. So the people who could afford to come to Florida to vacation and Christmas time and other times of the year were very, very wealthy people. They were not ordinary people. They were not, shall we say, the population that Disney World is trying to attract, a, a mass group of Americans. It was only after the 1950s and the 1960s in which Many Americans, first of all, get a week or two of summer vacation, uh, which wasn't common in the 20s and 30s. And earlier, people didn't have vacations, from paid vacations from work. There are a lot of factors that contributed uh, to this notion that Florida was a, uh, a, a playground. A lot of advertising and popular culture that emphasizes this. But that is only a part of the history of Florida and a, and a most recent part. Uh, Disney World, for example, opened in the 1970s. It hasn't been there forever. So it, it's, it's part of what I think uh, Dr. Mason and Dr. Rivers are seeing in their students is that they think that recent Florida is the way Florida has always been. And that's just untrue. 
And that's untrue about almost every form of history. What is happening today is the result of complex things, but there's a much longer history than what we ordinarily perceive by walking around today. I'm going to play the, I'm sorry, I'm gonna play the next section right now, um, which actually what we've been talking about with the migration works very well with this next section about early Florida and the migration of people into this area. The roots in the center of Florida's panhandle, once known as Middle Florida, are not unique. As the southern story goes, European explorers stumbled across the area, conquered or expelled the indigenous people here, and claimed the rich, fertile land as their own. In the 1800s, wealthy planters from the Upper South with family ties and political connections joined the battle to conquer the indigenous populations in an effort to dominate this new territory known as Middle Florida. Their whole purpose for coming here was to remove the indigenous people by force and change the uses of the land into extensive cotton cultivation. The land becomes the property of the federal government. Florida is a United States territory. And so the land was surveyed and put up for sale. From 1820 to 1860, you had what we call the second mass migration of slaves. The first mass migration was moved from Africa to the Americas, particularly to the colonies. But that second mass migration was from the upper south Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina, and even some from Georgia to the Lower South. In 1828, William Nuttall would forcibly march 40 of his enslaved workers from Virginia to his plantation El Destino in Jefferson County. Like many planters, Nuttall chose to bring a disproportionate number of men. Consequently, Husbands, wives, and children were permanently and tragically separated. The colonel was going on a trip to buy land in this place called Florida. Just before we left, the colonel sold my mother and brother. I cried when I had to leave my mother and brother in Virginia. Paige's master taught him to read and write. He taught Paige to read and write so that Paige could work in his general store. His mother and brother were sold on the auction block to raise the money that the master needed to make the trip from Richmond to Tallahassee. The trip took about seven to eight weeks. Whites rode in wagons and the slaves walked. They would stop after 20, 25 miles each day, after which the slaves would pitch the tents and, and put things ready for the evening. They would cook. And then sometimes they said, although they were tired, their owners made them entertain them by dancing and singing, and if someone could play the banjo or, or some other instrument. Another example of forced migration can be found with Hardy Croom, who would use proceeds wrung from the labor of his enslaved people to purchase 2,400 acres known today as Goodwood Plantation. He would then forcibly march his enslaved people for 29 straight days from North Carolina to Tallahassee. Um, I think that that, you know, was going to exactly what uh, all of you were talking about before about the migrations into the state. Somebody, um, we're going to be getting to more of the questions that are coming in, but there were two questions that sort of um, sparked that I wanted to get into now. One, somebody asked, how many plantations were in this area? Um, it, it's, it's really hard to determine how many. Uh, in, in the research that 
uh, I did, I found that uh, there were at least 350 plantations of 500 acres or more and many more plantations under 500 acres. But plantations uh, were created and plantations and farms were destroyed uh, based on the uh, economy. But but I'd like to to amplify on this whole concept of uh, migration. Um, when we look at this whole migration, it was a devastating impact on over a million enslaved people who were uprooted from the upper south, places like Maryland and Virginia, and brought to places like Florida and uh, Georgia and other places. And in my book on uh, Father Page, an enslaved preacher's climb to freedom, he talks about how grueling, how horrible the trip was and, and, and all the things that uh, he and other enslaved uh, people had to endure. And when you think about it in a, in a larger perspective, the first migration of enslaved uh, Africans occurred around 1630, ended with the, uh, the slave trade, international slave trade ending somewhere around 1808. You had about 500,000 that came to uh, the United States. Now, overall, there were about 12 to 13 million. But when you look at the second mass migration, which occurred from 1800 to around 1866, you had over a million enslaved people uprooted from the upper south to the lower south. So a lot of families were separated. Uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, babies were separated from, from mothers and fathers. Uh, the second migration, much like the first, uh, both migrations were devastating to, uh, to many of the uh, enslaved persons who found themselves uh, in servitude. I, I'd just like to uh, elaborate a little on what Dr. Rivers has, he has uh, really spoken very well to say. Uh, most people don't realize that the majority of both free and enslaved African Americans during the colonial era, this is the British colonial era we're talking about, because the Spanish came first, as did the French and the Dutch and a lot of other people. So, okay, we're just talking now about the British. Uh, the majority of those people lived in Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware, the vast majority. Very few lived in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and further south in 1750 or 1770 or 1790, which in the first census. However, once the international or transatlantic slave trade is officially ended. It becomes illegal in 1808, okay? It's illegal. That doesn't mean there aren't some people illegally bringing in enslaved people, there are. But the official slave trade becomes illegal. At that time, planters in Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware are experiencing, they have too many people. And in many cases, these are families that have been together Close together, even if your mother lived on another plantation, you it, under certain circumstances might be able to go over there. But these people have been living in Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware since 1620 or 1630 or 1640. They've had 150 years of living. And then in the early 19th century, in the early 1800s, after the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade is made illegal, they are forced west and south. We now think maybe a million and a half people, which is larger than the number of people who came in the transatlantic slave trade to what is now the U.S., they, that a million and a half people were forced marched to Florida, to western Georgia, to Alabama, to Mississippi, to Louisiana, the places that we now think of, or for much of American history, we thought of as being the Black Belt, the place where the majority of African Americans lived. That was a process that took place. And that's what Dr. Rivers is talking about, that process. 
Um, and that process relocated the entire population. Now, there's some other things that have happened since then, such as migrations that happened after the Civil War. But now we're talking in the period of enslavement, the antebellum, or uh, a period in which slavery is illegal in the United States. And, and slavery <laughs> was very important to a large fraction of white families. In the state of Florida, something like a third, 34% or more of white families uh, were involved in enslavement of Africans. 40% of the white population lived in families where you know, they were uh, uh, enslaving Africans. Now, most of these families were not the giant plantations. The right. big plantations that we hear so much about was an economic elite. Mm -hmm. um, some of the data that I've seen said that about half of all uh, um, families that, that uh, practice enslavement own just between two and 10 uh, people of African descent. Right. right? So the, the mm -hmm. big giant plantations that we hear about and that you often see in the movies were, were an elite, right? Uh, but slavery was widespread, and that's a point that needs to be emphasized because sometimes you also get the point of view, well, why did so few, why did whites import, uh, support slavery if so few people own slaves? Well, actually, a lot of white families lived off enslavement. They just weren't the big, big plantations. One of the questions oh. um, that came in relates to, oh, oh, sorry, Molly, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think, um, you know, right now, you know, the audience has sort of seen um, aspects of the journey that I was able to take, you know, listening and learning from these historians, you know, but something I didn't really know myself, having moved here, you know, not being from here, I wasn't aware of this, this second migration in the, in, in the, in the vastness that it took place. And actually, I was um, somebody who watched this documentary, a young man who watched a documentary said, oh, this is the trail of tears, you know, that and I thought, wow, that's a, a you know, I thought that was a very telling moment. I mean, we, we need to record all of the trails of tears that have happened. And um, and so I just am remarking and and being gra uh, grateful that I was able to have these historians, you know, um, aid me on the journey of making this because they're clearly yeah. a brain trust. I mean, it's, it's the migration into the state that plays a very big role in Florida becoming a part of the United States, right? The Spanish had always encouraged runaways to come into the state because we were, we were part of this great fight between these empires in Europe and the Spanish and the French were opposed to the English. And so the Spanish encouraged runaways to come to the state as a way of undermining the English colonies. In fact, you know, most people, if you ask them, well, what was the War of 1812 about? The first answer is, well, was there a war in 1812? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the war from which we get the national anthem. And it plays out as a whole separate kind of thing in Florida, where you had whites coming in trying to just forcibly take over the state. Mm -hmm. Because this was a place to run away to from mm -hmm. Georgia, from South Carolina, from other places that were pretty close. It's easier to get to Florida than it is to get to Ohio. And so that yeah. has to be stopped. So you get this contradiction where black freedom was a problem for the formation of America as a nation. Now, that is absolutely uh, correct, Dr. Mason. When you look at this whole concept of Florida, and you look at uh, early Fort Mose and, and other black communities, they, they were uh, endorsed by the Spanish in order to try to slow down the migration of white settlers into uh, Florida. And when you look at what Dr. Ruffins basically stated on the three Seminole Wars. If you if you talk about the three Seminole Wars in a general sense, uh, that uh, those wars uh, were attempts by white settlers to come in and basically displace 
the Seminoles and to spread the institution of slavery to get rid of the Seminoles and their black allies. And so when you when you look at Florida, it was always in flux. Uh, it was changing hands, as Dr. Ruffin said, from the Spanish, the British, the French at a time, and then uh, the Anglos. And but uh, at the end of the day, a lot of people knew that Florida could be a very good place for the production of cotton. And in a way, uh, in Gaston County, tobacco. Uh, tobacco became uh, the product. And in South Florida, sugar became the product. So when you look at Florida, it had various uh, regions and all those regions looked good to many of the settlers coming in there in terms of growing agricultural crops to make money. The bottom line, it was about money and nothing else was funny. Yes. Uh, two questions are sort of related to that. One of the questions from the audience was wondering about the um, the cattle industry. They thought it was more known in this area for cattle um, and that the freedmen went west as some of the early cowboys. Is is that something that happened in this area? I, I know that cattle was, it was a big, um, one of the, the bigger industries, but how was it? Was it at this time? Yes, the, the cattle industry existed, but primarily in central Florida. Uh, when you look at Kissimmee and other areas, the cattle industry really uh, expanded in those areas. And you had a lot of uh, independent uh, whites who identified with the cattle. Many of them did not own uh, enslaved people. They were called crackers, and they uh, owned one or two uh uh, cows or whatever, or a few cattle, uh, but they made their living uh, off of cattle and, and the byproducts of cattle. But you didn't find a whole lot of uh, cattle raising in middle Florida. Middle Florida was set aside for the production of cotton and nothing else would do. I mean, you, if you grew some corn or some other vegetables, it was for human consumption, but you spent, if you were a planter, you spent most of your time in the cultivation of cotton because that's where you made the most money. Were there? Just, oh, go so ahead. I just want to expand on that and say, reinforce that what Dr. Rivers is, is is talking about is what's commonly called cash crops. That's right. Um, so the big cash crops in the United, what becomes the United States, were first of all rice in the Carolinas. Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia, uh, before the Civil War, the rice planters were the richest planters in America. Uh, excuse me. Then you have tobacco, and tobacco grows very well in Maryland and Virginia and North Carolina and in parts of Florida. That was the second huge cash crop. Cotton was the third huge cash crop. Now, because uh, cotton... I don't know how many of you all have actually seen cotton growing or tried to have it a little little uh, uh, ball of cotton, but it it it, it holds very tightly. Yes, it to does to the to the <laughs> stem and the leaves that are around it, and it's and it's sort of thorny. Okay, so processing cotton was very difficult. It had to be hand processed until essentially Eli Whitney, and there are a lot of complicated stories about that, invents yeah. cotton gin, <laughs> which is in the late 1700s. And over time, by about the 1820s, there, there are many commercially available cotton gins, which allowed you to separate the cotton from the other elements of the plant much more effectively. That is part of what makes cotton king, as they say. That, that That's the king crop. Now, uh, just a, a footnote, of course, sugar in the Caribbean and in South America, sugar is the big cash crop. So Florida actually has in its one state all of those crops, okay? Yes. There's a little rice in the, in the north. It, rice goes out at the time of the Civil War. But cotton, little tobacco, okay. and sugar down in South Florida. So uh, Florida is unusual in that you see some presence of all of those cash crops. And it's the cash crops that are driving slavery. Were there were there slave auctions in, in Middle Florida? I know in the documentary, Valerie, you mentioned uh, 
them selling um, slaves before they moved into the area, and then others that went to, I think, New Orleans. So, Of course, but let me just comment here. Every slave enslaved person was not sold on an auction block in the center of the city. These right. are images that we have. Right. So, of course, there were some places where that might have occurred. A lot of these places where people are being sold, like if you had a planter and you wanted to sell people, people would right. come by your plantation and you say, you know, well, I'm offering Joe and Jim and Susie. And if you want to buy them, you could take them. You didn't have to be on an auction block. You could just be sold from where you were standing, okay, in, in mm -hmm. a field or in the plantation. You also could be sold if you were, if you had been, if your plantation person, slaveholder, had sold you to a slave trader, then the traders are the people who are going around on ships, but they're also force marching people. And they're selling people off in different cities and different places and different mm -hmm. plantations. So there's many places that people could be sold, not just auction blocks. But of course, there were auction blocks everywhere that was slavery. How would you have slavery without being able to buy and sell these people? Of course. Dr. Dr. Ruffins is absolutely correct. I just want to expound on one thing as it relates uh, to uh, Leon County. Uh, when uh, Tallahassee became the seat of the state uh, during the antebellum period, you, you did have people coming to the capital and trading in yeah. enslaved yeah. people. However, as Dr. Ruffin stated, they, they bought and sold anywhere they wanted. I mean, right. it, it didn't, it wasn't limited to a particular place. But uh, in terms of uh, James Page that I researched, uh, his mother and his brother were sold on the auction block at Wall Street uh, in, in Richmond. However, a lot of other enslaved persons were, were sold in the homes of folk. They were sold right. behind barns. A lot of times right. people did not want to know that they were selling enslaved people. So they right. were done, it's a lot of times they were sold quietly. So, mm -hmm. uh, to, to this image of a uh, majority of enslaved people on the auction block is one that, uh, is basically a myth because, uh, enslaved people were walking cash. And anytime you needed money and you saw somebody along the road who would purchase them, you would, you, you could sell them if you so desire. Dr. Rivers, you mentioned James Page again, and we saw a little bit of the start of his story in that clip. He actually has quite a, a he, he appears other times in the, in the film as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about his life and his connection to the, to our community? I would love to, uh, uh, James Page, uh, as I stated earlier, was uh, bought involuntarily from Richmond uh, to Tallahassee by his uh, enslaver, John Park Hill, in 1827. John Park Hill teaches uh, Page how to uh, read and write so he could work in his uh, in his store. But when Page gets to uh, Tallahassee, he has to learn how to be an, an overseer and a lot of people think that there were not many uh, black overseers and drivers, but there were quite a few. We just don't know their names. That's part of the hidden history that we're trying to bring out. Uh, Page uh, goes on to, uh, to continue to read and write. He starts a church in 1828 as a church without uh, walls, brush arbor, out in the woods. Uh, the, the church de develops into a, a place in, uh, in Bel Air where, uh, where Woodville is now. Um, and then he, his master allows him to travel throughout the state of Florida and throughout the southeastern region. We talk about the, the travels of Frederick Douglass, but, uh, a lot of people don't know that Page traveled to Georgia, he traveled to Mississippi, he traveled to Alabama, he traveled uh, throughout uh, 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 Florida. So when we look at his impact, and by the time he passed in 1883, he would have helped to establish over a hundred churches in the Southeastern region. And he is also the founder of the historic Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, which, which was the epic center of the Tallahassee bus boycott and the civil rights movement in Tallahassee led by 
uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, C.K. Steele. So, so we, we have uh, 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 a man who, working with others, left a heck of a legacy in terms of church building, building up the Baptist uh, uh, religion, as well as establishing edifice that would be used later uh, to continue the civil rights struggle. We are um, qu quickly getting closer to the end of our, our time period. And I wanna show another clip from the film. Um, this next uh, time, actually we're, we're racing forward in history and it's gonna focus on the Jim Crow era. And I'd like our audience to know that it does include stories and images of violence during that time period. So please be aware of that. The system of Jim Crow began, I mean, again, if people pick a year, a lot of times they'll say 1877, when Reconstruction comes to an end. The local white population didn't just sit back and say, okay, we accept that these people are free. You would get people who at one point in slavery, right, they were legally enslaved, and now there were these other economic arrangements which had the same force of keeping people enslaved. So you arrest people for some trumped up charge. You lease them out. So the local and state government makes a profit. And because they have a criminal record, they can't vote. Leon County, the African-American population outnumbered the white population six to one. So what do you do when you are outnumbered and therefore people will outvote you? You have to find a way of suppressing the vote. That does not change from 1865 to 2020. In 1866, the Florida legislature determined any person of color who was deemed to be wandering or strolling about or leading an idle, profligate, or immoral course of life could be arrested and sentenced to 12 months of labor. In addition, it was determined by the Florida legislature that a felony conviction would result in loss of voting rights for life. The Ku Klux Klan also emerged to intimidate and terrorize the newly freed men and women. Unable to testify against whites in court, black families had little to no protection from the terrors and horrors perpetuated by the Klan. Social interaction meant that blacks and whites were on an equal status, and that just could not be. The law said that you had to be here, you couldn't be there, you couldn't have this job, you couldn't do that. You had to defer to white people that you came in contact with, if you came in contact with them at all. One of the enforcement mechanisms of Jim Crow was lynching. If you try to become politically independent, if you try to become economically independent, not only will we kill you, but we will kill you in a very violent manner. It was justified in the Bible. It was justified by scientists and anthropologists. And even after the Civil War, that this was an inferior race in a number of ways. It says in the Bible that slaves are supposed to be obedient. Somehow, they never got out of the idea, well, these people are not slaves. They're emancipated. Four documented lynchings in Tallahassee. Now, we know there were more than four, but only four that we have records of. Pierce Taylor in 1897, Mick Morris in 1909, and then in 1937, Richard Hawkins and Ernest Ponder, they were teenagers. They were all taken out of the Leon County Jail, which was over on Gaines Street on the edge of Cascades Park. The same story over and over again. A group of whites, you know, came to the jail and met with no resistance in taking a prisoner. And whether it happened in your community or not, you were aware of these incidents of violence taking place. And again, it's, it's, it's the fear. It's the fear that is used to control blacks. So that was this pattern. A lot of the lynchings 
happen to people who, uh, if you if you follow the story, they had been successful in some way. For instance, I think it was one of the Rollins men who brought in the most cotton that year. It wasn't too long after that that his barn caught a fire. Luckily, they got the horses out and everything before it burned. Now, I remember very well um, the first electrocution that impacted me because it was of a young man. He was one of the Beard Boys, B-E-A-R-D. That was a large family of about eight children that we went to school with. And I just heard them talking about Abraham Beard would be electrocuted that next week or whatever it was. In my mind, it just seems like that was such a dark day, like an overcast day. And it ended up that the lady confessed. She did not tell the truth, that he did not assault her, but it's too late. Had to make sure my mute was undone there. Um, the that is a hard section to watch of what was happening. Um, many of our questions deal with have you you know there's the the slavery issue and all this that came with it. Did any more personal? Uh, one person asked, did any new individual histories were they unpacked during the researching? researching for this documentary, Valerie? Well, that's one of the challenges of, um, you know, history about the enslaved. No one was recording that that was not valued, you know, uh, capturing their lives as humans. Um, and so it's quite difficult, actually. So you end up getting glimpses. But um, through, you know, through the research, though, to answer the question, for me, learning about um, Father Page, I didn't know his full story. And so, uh, uh, so now I have a better sense of it. You know, I didn't understand, you know, his, um, how his mother and, and brother were sold and how his father, you didn't mention this, Dr. Rivers, but how his father um, went, you know, uh, as part of the colonization to to, um, to Liberia, I believe. And, and so That's different great. things like that. And then of course, I also learned about um, Patrick's um, forebear, you know, who he mentioned, you know, so through talking to individuals who either had researched it or with Patrick, who's a literal forebear, I did learn more about um, individuals, you know, here. Other than that, mostly what I end up learning is maybe glimpses of people who were in house, um, worked in the house, you know, who were slaves for the house. And you learn a little bit, but usually it's really, for me, a small snapshot. They moved here, they did this, they were sold here, then we lost track of them, you know? So I, that's one of the big challenges about this hidden history. I'd like to to uh, talk a little bit, go back. I know this is a, a very sensitive uh, segment about lynching. And the concept of lynching was no more than legalized terrorism. This was terrorism uh, with the blessings, unfortunately, of the federal government. There was an attempt, an anti-lynching bill by a congressman named Dyer that never the, really saw the light of day. They they tried several times to get it passed to make it illegal, but the same legislators and congresspersons uh, in the legislature and Congress did not see fit. People who participated in these lynchings uh, were emboldened. They took pictures. They had they smiled, and and so when you look at this whole concept of terrorism. This is one of the, along with, of course, violence against enslaved people, uh, this terrorism and and most of the lynchings, and I, I read a lot of the lynching reports put out by Tuskegee. Tuskegee had a great uh, 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 <laughs> list of lynchings. It was always on the alleged rape of a white woman by a black man. And 99% of it, when they actually found out, that was not true. It was a means after uh, slavery ended to socially and economically control now free right. people. Because when you control the land, you control the means of economy and the means of production. You control the very people who you had under your foot earlier on as enslaved people. Yeah, I mean, the lynching, if lynching wasn't 
state sponsored terrorism. It certainly was a public private partnership in terrorism. And the idea was to make people afraid, right? If you kill someone as a public spectacle, you, 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 you kill them, you know, they weren't always lynched by a rope, sometimes just shot. They were frequently burned. And if it, you know, they were uh, disproportionately male and there was often some sort of sexual mutilation of the body. Correct. Yeah. Right. So you get all these things and it's designed to incite fear. Fear. Right. That if 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 you strive to be independent, if you strive for political empowerment, this is what will happen to you. If you if you refuse to accept your position as racially subordinate, bad things will happen to you. And if and 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 and, and where do you go? Right. So I've I've looked at like lynching pictures. And one of the things that really bothered me so much about the picture recently of, of the police officer with his foot, his knee on the neck of George Floyd, is he's looking directly into the camera, which is very similar to what people did during lynching. Correct. Absolutely. They would have the body burned up in front of them or hanging from a rope, and they'd be there with their Sunday best on looking directly into the camera. Why would somebody look directly into a camera at the site of a murder? Because they're not worried about the police arresting them, right? The direct face in the camera itself is an act of rebellion. It's like, not only can we kill you, we can do it publicly and nothing will happen to us and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, Florida was a state with a lot of violence during Reconstruction. Yes. <clears throat> Even before the massive lynching starts, there's a lot of violence in this state. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is the period after, I mean, slavery itself is violent, right? And then after enslavement, it becomes even more violent because now you have in middle Florida counties that were overwhelmingly black. These were black mm -hmm. counties mm -hmm. with a white minority population. And not mm -hmm. only were they black counties, but they were people who were determined to obtain political and economic power and run their own life. Another one of my ancestors was Charles Rollins. Charles Rollins had rented himself out during, during the period of enslavement, which is a weird concept to think about, right? You go to work, you earn some money, and you pay somebody else rent right. on yourself mm -hmm. so that your life becomes your capital, right? That is just bizarre. But Charles Rollins is good friends with James Page. In fact, he is one of the trustees of the Sunday school that James Page starts. And the, the, the Sunday school is where people learn to read and write. So you have churches that are functioning as governments. You have these independent leaders. You have these people, some of whom were enslaved, some of whom fought with the Union Army, some of whom were free people, but they're all coming together, exercising leadership. They're not supposed to be able to do that, right? Supposedly, they weren't smart enough for independent government. But they're proving that that's a lie, right? And it's, it's not just Florida where this is a problem. Uh, I, in my profession in economics, the economists and the statisticians, as Jim Crow goes on, puts out the lie that black people in America would just die out, right? Without white overlords, we weren't sufficiently smart to govern our own lives and eventually we would just die out. In fact, Du Bois, that happen. <laughs> du Bois in one of his autobiographies, he wrote three, <laughs> said that his greatest joy in life was he outlived the economists who said black people were gonna die out. <laughs> so you get this violence. And, and, as, and, and, and the violence is part of a political economic process of domination and control. Yes. 
with convict yeah. leasing, yeah. debt peonage, chain gangs, sharecropping, and all of this is designed to, 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 to do the same thing slavery did. Have one group of people generate a massive amount of wealth and wow. another group of people appropriate the wealth. And it worked. Well, I, and if you I, have I, to I, deny democracy in the process, so be it. Because there's a choice. You can be a slave society or a democratic society, but you can't be both. You can be a Jim Crow society or a democratic society, but you can't be both. Right? Slavery and Jim Crow are anti-democratic systems, but they're wealth generating systems. They're wealth stealing systems. And that's that violence of lynching gives way to death sentencing, gives way to police assassinations. But it's all part of the same process where black life doesn't have value. This comes in um, to can one I, of the questions. I, that, can I just say something? Sure. Um, one, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sources that Valerie was talking about. So people get a more complex understanding. Um, which is that um, there are sources to understand what happened with enslaved people, but they're not as many as we would like, okay? That's what it is. It's not that there are no sources, right. but they're not as many as we would like. And those sources, some of them come from uh, what used to be called slave narratives or self-emancipating narratives. People right. who had been enslaved who managed to get free and then can write their story <clears throat> or publish their story. Now, the most famous person of that is Frederick Douglass, but there are a number of, of uh, narratives that were published over the years. There are also inventories, wills, letters, and other kinds of documents from plantation. Now, these documents are all written from the perspective of the white slave owners, but nonetheless, they do give us some information. And then a really important source uh, that was created in the 20th century are the um, uh, the FSA, the uh, farm, the the writings. There was, was a project. Let me start over. There was a project conducted by the federal government during the 1930s, and because in the 30s they realized that both people who had been slaveholders and people who had been enslaved were dying out. The last oh, yeah. people who were alive, who'd ever experienced that, were dying out. So they conduct a national survey that produces state by state hundreds of narratives which are recorded and transcribed. They're, the, most of them are in the Library of Congress today in, the, in uh, Washington, but a number of them were also kept by the states. That's and right. there are w also some at important uh, African American universities, right. like this. W the W, the WPA that you're talking about, the, the Works Progress Administration, right? The Works Progress Administration did that. So, right. and the, the, those sources are part of what created the efflorescence of scholarship in the '60s and '70s and '80s, because people began to go back to those narratives which had been dismissed and see what's in them and what they tell us. Yes. Now, many of those people had were, were young when they were enslaved. A few of them are older so that they live to adulthood in slavery. But if you think slavery ended in 1865, officially, and we're now in the 1930s, you had to live a very long life to get yeah. into <laughs> these, to get into these. But that is a very important uh, source. There are other kinds of narratives too that were taken and there are other kinds of records. And now we have something that we never had before, which is DNA evidence. So new evidence, new kinds of evidence can emerge. So I just wanted to say that. And then the other thing I wanted to say was um, reinforcing what Dr. Mason said. It's important to realize that lynching was not something by itself. It was the way, the most violent and most <clears throat> uh uh, a brutal way of reinforcing an entire system of oppression. So he talked about debt, peonage. He talked about the crop lien system. He talked about <clears throat> uh, putting people in jail for vagrancy laws and put people in jail for not really doing 
you know, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time, <clears throat> maybe minding their own business. Now you're in jail. You may never even get out. And so these are, and prison records are another source of information mm. about people. So uh, there was recently a, a, a fascinating book published about black women in Florida and Georgia who were imprisoned in the late 19th century. So there are sources, but many of these sources do not carry individual stories from death, from birth to death. That's the problem. You may get a story, but you may just get a section mm -hmm. of that person's story, unless they were able to um, write a narrative or live into freedom and write letters or things like this. But many of the people who were the children of people who were enslaved said that their parents wouldn't talk about slavery. That's right. So there is um, a, some generational silences that took place. Uh, many of those children who, of course, now they're all dead too. But many of the children of people who had been enslaved said that they really wouldn't talk about those times or they would only talk about them with other people. Because you have to realize that if you lived in between 1850 and 1900, or 1910, and you were African American, there were many people in your church or community who had who had been enslaved. They're still living, those people. So there, there were moments, sometimes they're church records, there are moments where people can communicate, but it's not as detailed as we would like. I'd like to add to, to what uh, Dr. Ruffin said in terms of sources. One of the things that I found uh, that was so good in terms of my research on Father James Page was that he did an interview three years before he passed. He did it in 1880. He passed in 1883. And so we have the voice of one of over right. 10,000 enslaved preachers. We know that they existed, but we don't have their voice. We, we don't know what they said. Here is an example of right. an enslaved preacher who left his voice to talk mm -hmm. about what life was like for him from slavery to freedom. So sources are important. And when you look at the Florida narratives, a lot of people say that uh, the, the interviewees did not hold back because most of their interviewers were African American. So they didn't feel like they had to kind of sugarcoat things. And so you find a lot more brutality mentioned mm -hmm. in the Florida narratives than in some of the other narratives. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a comment on the issue of police brutality. Um, I think it's important to note that lynching, lynchings and, and other things like storming black towns and burning them down, rioting, right. um, these are, extra legal. In other words, they're, they're not actually legal, but the forces of order do not enforce them. They're just allowed, they're just allowed to, to, to rampage. Extra legal, right. Or to do what they want, extra legal. This does change when policing, formal policing begins throughout the nation. And a lot of the ways that police are trained early on is based on those slave patrols of the of the antebellum era. The direct the connection between police that we think of for the most part in urban areas, but they're in rural areas too, and and how they behave is very much based on. Um, there's a direct line to controlling enslaved people. Mm -hmm. There, then you get brutality that is directly enacted by the state, mm -hmm. by the forces who are supposed to protect and serve are directly state bound enforcing yeah. brutality against people. And that is one of the differences that is important to understand as we fight these things is both their origin mm -hmm. and the nature, because you are, when you attack that, you're attacking the government itself. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, this has something to do with why it has been so difficult to, to uh, uh, force change in those, in those, in those uh, situations. So I would just um, say, this is something that is the result 
of African Americans becoming a more urbanized population in the 20th century after the Great Migration and the development of, of uh, police forces in cities. And this is where you begin. Most of, <clears throat> in 1968, there's a famous report called the Kerner Commission. To look at all the riots that happened in the 60s up till that time. There were a lot of riots after because uh, uh, Martin Luther King is killed, but all the riots before 67. And in the Kerner Commission, the, five, the uh, reports of the field workers and the social scientists say riots started because of incidents of police brutality. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. They started Absolutely. because of incident. That's how the, that's the spark, incidents of police brutality. So these are very deeply rooted things in American mm -hmm. society. I mean, the, the, the extra legal activity, the lynchings, were supported by legal activity also designed to stymie African-American progress and to expropriate property. You know, it, 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 when we think about government agencies that are problems for African-Americans, the, the, the zoning or growth management people, the taxing folks, and the police. Three local government offices that are very important. And so you, you, you think about, like I had a relative who left Tallahassee, went to Jacksonville, and lived in a community there known as Lavala. Right? Very successful community with large numbers of African Americans, separate from the city of Jacksonville. The whites in Jacksonville wanted the property in Lavala, so they annexed it, thus bringing black progress to a halt. So sometimes it's the extra legal violence, and sometimes it's the domination of the law. And if you cannot vote, the law will not represent you. So you take away the right to vote so that you can use the law against the people that, whose property you, you, you're trying to take. And during Jim Crow, in the midst of this massive violence and attack from the state, African-Americans didn't just quit, didn't just say, oh, we can't make it. If you look at when a lot of the historical black colleges and universities come into existence, they come into existence during the midst of Jim Crow. They come into existence when black people are getting lynched. If you look at other organizations like the National Baptist Convention, who has its roots in the Bethlehem Baptist Association, founded by James Page, Charles Rollins is a part of it, that then becomes a model for what becomes the National Baptist Convention so you had land accumulation, you had education, you had churches graduating students and teaching people how to read and write and lots of emphasis on education, even though getting more education didn't necessarily translate into more income. People still wanted it, which gives, which, which shows that this whole ideology, this whole myth that African-Americans didn't want to be educated, didn't want to be skilled, have an anti-intellectual culture. This is just not true. People wanted education even if it didn't translate into more money in the market. All right? So you have this progress, and how do you stop it? Well, you stop it by lynching people, killing them, et cetera. But even that didn't stop it completely. I mean, Dr. I was Mason, I Dr. Dr. Rivers, Dr. Ruffins, <laughs> Valerie, thank you all. We've run out of time. Oh, I would yeah. love to keep the conversation oh, well, going. I, let me just say that this this conversation was part of the goal of this documentary. Um, and and generating it, you know, you know, even wider. So I'm I'm grateful for this opportunity and um and want to thank my team, the, you know, my, my production team, Sherry and Teresa and Mark and and the music. Jamal, you know, who wrote it spe specifically for this documentary, and of course, these great panelists and this conversation. So, thank you. We're uh, we're going to try, I think, to answer some questions offline and and maybe post some of that later. I really uh, want to thank all of you for joining this conversation, yeah. panelists Valerie Schoon, Dr. Larry Rivers, Dr. Patrick Mason, and Dr. Faith Davis Ruffin. Remember, everybody, um, you can. I'm going to share the screen one more time here.
Um, and did I share the right screen? Um, try that again. Sorry. All right. Uh, you remember, you can see the full documentary, Invisible History, Middle Florida's Hidden Roots, a film by Valerie Schoon on WFSU Public Media, Thursday, May 20th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Many other Florida public media stations plan to share it on that day, and other stations around the country will be sharing it starting June 19th. And you see the local schedules for dates and times for that. And um, we are going to be, we've been recording this conversation, and we will be posting it online later and um, I just want to say thanks again to everybody who has taken part in tonight's event. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. off? I don't know yet. <laughs> Some people are still rolling off. Um, yeah. Just letting you know, Brandy is stopping the stream. She's on the phone with Kevin.